Bao Hang. This is where it all happened a long time ago. Back then, it was a dried out swamp, a billabong. Now, it's a rubber plantation. I was here as a soldier, a 20-year-old kid, a conscript. My rifle was destroyed, and I was sitting in a hole on the ground as hundreds of enemy came running at us in human waves, just wanting to kill us as we wanted to kill them. I gave up my sanity that night. And for the past 46 years, I've been searching to get it back. You have just watched an excerpt from the documentary The Crater, co-produced by the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, or ABC, in 2013-2014. The film was broadcasted in Australia, striking viewers with a strong message on how brutal a war can be. War should never happen. The film features the story told by Brian Cleaver, a soldier at the 3rd Royal Australian Regiment during his service in southern Vietnam more precisely in the area of Binh Mi Commune, Binh Dương Province. Brian directly engaged in fierce battles, which claimed lives on both sides. The war left behind lingering consequences, with mothers losing their children, wives losing their husbands. Agent Orange dioxin and explosive remnants of war remain a burden for future generations. On the other side, the defeated came home obsessed with terrific images of the war, scarred in their mind for the rest of their lives. With a deep desire to restore his sanity, Brian has spent 14 years looking for the burial site of 42 Vietnamese martyrs whose death he witnessed. Hi, Brian. Thank you for coming to our show. My pleasure. So you fought um, the war for 10 months. How did you feel most of the time then? My feelings were I have just been plucked out of a teenage life the government has called us to do a job. We did not know what we were fighting for. Well, you're being deployed to Vietnam. I've got no idea where Vietnam was. We had to look up an atlas to find out where Vietnam was. It gave us no impetus to actually really put in a big effort. That soon changed when the first shot is fired at you you realise it's either them or you. You then have to fight. Could you tell us what happened during the battlefield on May 28, 1968? What was the strongest impression you had during that chaotic time? Now, I, going back right to the beginning, is this particular operation which was called Operation Tone Tang, Total Victory, involved two Australian battalions and an artillery, positioned five kilometres apart. It was the largest deployment of military personnel, equipment, supplies, the most protracted engagement with regular trained North Vietnamese soldiers. It lasted 25 days. It was the largest battle Australia was involved in in the entire 10-year conflict in Vietnam. The, there were two assaults by the NVA Viet Cong on our position called Balmoral. The first assault occurred on the early hours of the morning of the 26th. We believe it was just a probe, not really a major assault, but a probe. But it was, uh, it was very fierce, and they came across open ground directly onto D Company, 3rd Royal Australian Regiment. 
Could you tell us what happened um, on the morning right after May 28th um, battlefield? What did you see and do? My job was to escort the wounded soldiers back into our medics. I cannot remember how many times I went out and brought soldiers in. But I do remember the very last soldier I brought in, I had to carry because of his wounds were so bad. He was in immense pain and uh, from a, a stomach wound, a, a bullet had gone through stomach and out his back. What other horrific scenes that were out on the battlefield were not just dead bodies. You get used to seeing a dead body, but when you see pieces of body scattered around, that makes your stomach turn. It, it is the most horrific sight that anyone could imagine. I said to Paul, who the fuck did you piss off? Because everyone is here. What have they got against us? There is also a piece of armament called a Bangalore torpedo. They slip the torpedo bomb underneath the wire, set the bomb off, which blows a hole in the wire. The barrel of Paul Donnelly's gun was absolutely red hot and the gun would stop firing. Stop it! Cock the gun, clear the stoppage and then continue firing, happen again. We can't have the gun stop, what am, what, what am, what am I going to do? We poured our water bottles on the gun to cool it down to keep the gun operable. And I said, for Christ's sake, we don't pour all our water on there, we're going to lose it all. He said, oh, I'll have to have a piss on it. And I said, oh, yeah, right. We had to actually piss on the gun. How we did that under the, under the conditions we were doing, I don't know. And it's very hard to piss when you're sort of a little bit, a, a, an adrenaline rush. But I knew he'd had to piss on it because when I fired the gun, the gun in the barrel stunk to high heaven. Let's now talk about the filmmaking process. How long did it all take? It actually took two years to produce. I heard that most of the scenes were reenacted in Australia. Is that true? Did you consult the film crew? It is true. No, I did not consult the film crew. I was uh, pushed aside because the director felt that I would be too critical. But uh, the, the sections where I am actually out on the field searching. I was doing my own thing. The cameraman just followed me around and every now and again I would call him in to a particular site. There's something interesting here. Could be worth letting the camera roll. But uh, that was the only time that I became really involved with the cameraman, with the producer. In which occasion you decided to start looking for the site? Ah, that was 2002. Um, it had been going through my mind for several years. I was questioning myself. I'd like to go back to Vietnam. Is it the right thing to do? Do I really want to go? Very, very hesitant. And then my wife said, you should go. Okay, let's do it, let's go. Uh, the truth hit when I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the then secretary of the Minmi People's Committee. I showed him what we call our tour book, detailing various elements of the tour. 
And of course, Balmoral was in that book. Photographs, number of dead, when the, the, uh, the battles took place. And he very calmly reached down into the bottom drawer of the filing cabinet and pulled out a sheet of papers, documents. And it was a document in chronological sequence of the events that took place in that province, the province under his jurisdiction, during the entire 10-year war. So we asked him to look up the 28th of May, 1968. And in one paragraph, basically, it stated that troops fresh from the north mounted an assault on unknown forces, resulting in 41 men missing in action. And I showed him our book. We, we buried 42 in a bomb crater. That's no coincidence. So it was at that point he asked me, could you please help us try and find our men? How could I say no? When re a request of that nature I said, yes, I'll do everything I possibly can. Mm -hmm. Not knowing oh, I was going to be at it for 15 years. I don't have children. No, I, I made a conscious decision not to have children. I had seen too many veterans bear children with various deformities and miscarriages. Asian orange was clearly on my mind. If I bore a child that had a defect and I knew there was the possibility of that child having a defect which associated to Agent Orange, uh, I would be just absolutely devastated. And I doubt if I would have been able to cope. It's just dry soil. There's no clay in it. It's come off the surface as the digger has gone through and turned it. But there is the bottom of the crater. It's clay. To start your search for the burial site, how much time and labour did you um, spend on the research work? I spent so much time that my wife got to the stage where she said, I don't want to know anything about it. I'm sick of hearing you talk about Balmoral. I was getting the same feedback from my personal friends. I was obsessed in finding these men. So when did you officially begin your, your search? Um, when was the first dig carried out? It would have been in 2002, 2003. Um, and my thoughts were, okay, I was not a witness of the burial. I need to find people who actually witnessed or took part in gathering the bodies and witnessing the burial. The first person I approached looked at me and told me where to get off. He was not prepared to talk about his experiences in Vietnam. And that is very common, or was very common at the time. So I backed off. 
I was not going to ask questions of any of my friends, my fellow service personnel, for fear that I was going to stir up emotions that they were actually trying to hide. There was an embargo placed on all material relating to the Vietnam War was put in embargo. Nobody had access to it until the 30 years had expired. As soon as the 30 years had expired, I had free access to all the information that was available. That's when I started to put pieces together. So that's what, 68 plus 30? Explain to us how you figure out where to dig and, um, and how you actually did it. We all knew, everybody knew, that the dead were placed in a bomb crater. Unfortunately, there were many bomb craters in the area. So which one of those bomb craters was the actual burial site? Nobody could tell me which one. All they could tell me was no further than 75 metres from our position out from 11 platoon. Our machine gun was on a little protrusion of land and it ran parallel to the western border. And so when they said straight out from our gun, it's not straight out the middle here, it's straight out there. So my search area was there. So how many bomb craters did you dig out eight. in total? Eight. How big the area did you cover? 50 metres by 50 metres. When you look back on all those efforts to, to, to dig the bomb craters, what do you think is, um, has been the biggest challenge? Oh, the rain. Water was our biggest problem. How come? It's a drainage swamp. In the wet season, the whole area is flooded. This is the last position to dry out. But even right at the end of the dry season, you only have to dig down two metres or three metres and you're starting to get very dirty, wet, muddy soil. And these bomb craters originally were about six metres deep. Right now, with only three hours at my, three hours left, it's not looking promising. Okay, this one's finished. I could probably get extra time if I was uh, well and truly onto the sniff of something, but I think we've come to the end. I'm sorry that we haven't been able to find them, but I'm happy that we found the location. The map. No. Look. Many times. Look. Uh, uh, this make us stronger, Brian. It's okay. Come a bit. Search is finished. We're finished. I'm sorry. I'm sorry we have not been able to find them. Fifty meter, by fifty meter. This is sacred ground. They are here. Just maybe they don't want to be found. They want to stay together. The moment you told others that you would stop your search, how did you feel? I stopped searching after 14 years for two reasons. One, 
I had no further material to use. I felt that I had gone as far as I possibly could, had done as much as I possibly could, and I also had uh, own personal reasons for stopping. I just had to stop. Even though I made that statement, it was not going to stop me from looking for these men. If new, fresh information came available, I would take it on board and analyse it and look at it, even if it meant coming back and digging another position, I would do so. Over there. My friends, I am here. I want to find you. I need to return you to your families. Yes. Chúng tôi sĩ quan quân đội và làm công tác chính sách. Thành ra tức lúc ban đầu tiên khi được lệnh của cấp trên giao nhiệm vụ là đi cùng với một cụ chi minh úc để đi tìm mộ ở trên cái đất ở cái cái bầu bầu đồng tràm này bầu hang này bắt đầu từ năm 2003 cho tới hôm nay. Ok. After receiving a helicopter photograph has given me a new direction to concentrate on. That direction from being this big is now down to this big. And we are sitting right in the middle of it. I strongly believe that somewhere just in here lie 41, 42 men waiting to be found and returned to their loved ones. Untouched is this yellow colour this white colour, the edge of a crater, possibly. At the end of the war, information about the dead should have been handed over to the authorities, and the authorities had teams to come out and search for these men. The problem I found in the Australian documents is this burial location was not Recorded. For 15 years, 14 years, I searched, searched, searched. Without this piece of information. Đối với một kẻ thù cũ mà họ rất nước mắt khi tìm đến một bộ hài cốt của đồng đội mình thì mình rất là cảm động. I have gone from searching well, a hundred meters out from where we found the unknown right up to the edge, the western edge of Bahang. I have searched with GPR. I have dug many holes. Never will I lose my hope. One day, these men will be found. Dĩ vãng nó trôi qua bao nhiêu năm đã từng là kẻ thù bắn vào nhau. Mà bây giờ, ông đã, đã bỏ công, bỏ sức, bỏ tiền, bỏ bạc ở cái tuổi đã 60, 68 tuổi và thời điểm đã cũng năm mấy tuổi, 50, 55 tuổi mà lộ vô rừng mình đang sống ở cái cuộc sống tiện nghi đang sống ở cái đời sống nó đầy đủ mà bây giờ bỏ vô rừng ăn cơm hộp, ăn cơm bụi với, với người Việt Nam mình trong rừng khô khan không có nước trắng cháy mũi mạng mỏng mà đi tìm như thế 13 năm thì tấm lòng phải công nhận là rất là đáng trân trọng
Tell us more about Viet. Why do you think he could be so devoted to your search? He is an MIA officer, was himself. He has found many, many dead soldiers buried. He knows what it feels like to find a soldier and have his rem remains returned to the family. So he knows how I feel better than anybody else. And that is why he is so dedicated to helping me. One request and he will attend to it without any question. Was there any moment during the search when you felt so desperate, you just wanted to give up all of this? Never, never, not on one occasion was I prepared to give up. So what kept you so motivated all those years? That's a very good question and it's a very easy question to answer. And I would put it to you. If you were one of the dead, would you hope that somebody was looking for you to return you to your family? You have answered your own question. Simple as that. During his stay in Vietnam this time, which lasts for two months, Brian spent a couple of days visiting Hanoi, where he had a reunion with a special friend. Let's find out more. Hey, buddy. The special friend that Brian arranged to meet today is Le Tu Minh. Yes. They've gone through ups and downs together in the search for Vietnamese martyrs over the almost past 10 years. Maybe 10 this is the first time Brian has visited the Vietnam Military History Museum. The objects on display here reaffirm the cruelty of war. They include numerous kinds of bombs, mines and other explosives dropped on Vietnam during the war, causing lingering consequences that Ryan knows still exist today. Those bomblets are still being found today, mm, up yeah. in, particularly up in the highlands, yeah, after the rainy so season. Cases, uh, Children are picking them up, losing an arm. Uh, cows walking along feeding, stand on one. It'll blow his leg off or possibly kill him because it'll go yeah. into his stomach. As a soldier who served his country for nearly 20 years and after years further searching for the great size of Vietnamese martyrs with Brian, Bing well understands the consequences of the war. Big, heavy machine gun. Nếu mà chúng ta nói rằng là bao nhiêu người bị hy sinh, bao nhiêu người bị thương, nó cũng chỉ là bề nổi thôi. Thế còn cái, cái, cái phần dưới của một cái, cái tảng băng đó nó là rất lớn là cái mà nó thương tổn mà chúng ta không thể nào nhìn thấy được cho cả hai phía ví dụ như là phía bên mình thì các bà mẹ nỗi đau đớn đó nó truyền lại nhiều thế hệ nhiều người chứ không phải riêng cái bản thân cái, cái người liệt sĩ đó yes. Bình has known Brian for a long time However, it was not until 2008 that they had a chance to meet each other and to find together the grab site of the 42 martyrs. The digging can only be done in the dry season, which is from March to the beginning of May. Đến mùa mưa thì cả cái khu vực này là nó ngập nước. Mình chỉ đào xuống độ khoảng một mét thôi là bắt đầu có nước. Nếu mà đưa máy xúc mà bánh xích vào thì thì nó sẽ phá nát cái 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 vườn cao su cho nên phải sử dụng những cái máy xúc nhỏ hơn và khi mà xúc đào sâu xuống ấy thì cả cái xe đấy là nó nó bị chìm vào trong cái đám lầy đó và thậm chí là có một lần là chúng tôi phải thuê thêm một cái cái máy xúc khác để mà cứu cái máy xúc mà bị bị lầy. I, I remember. Both of them remember well the time in 2009 they got their greatest hope that their research would be successful. After using modern devices such as radar to look underground and excavators with continuous tracks to dig with, they found a body in a 4 to 5 meter deep bomb crater. It was then identified as the body of a soldier from the Liberation Army. If we dug any earlier, we always hit water. Yeah. We yeah. even hit water here. Yeah, we have it. And it rained. The soil is so, uh, so wet. So wet, so muddy, so sticky. The yeah. good thing is it didn't cave in. Mm. But this was the day we found 
the unknown soldier uh, of Bauhan. Yeah. We had just found him because mm. we are, uh, everybody has stopped working yeah. and we are all placing incense placing sticks. Incense stick. We are giving our blessing to mm. the soldier. Mm. Theo mình hiểu cái việc mà anh ấy suy nghĩ về cái việc tìm kiếm 42 liệt sĩ của quân đội mình ấy là một cái đau đáu trong 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 anh ấy. có lẽ là không biết đến bao giờ thì nó thôi. Mặc dù là mình với Việt ấy đều là nói với Brian là mày phải thôi đi bởi vì là mày đã uh, cái sức khỏe bây giờ nó không còn tốt như ngày xưa rồi thì bị các cái chấn thương về tâm lý về trầm cảm cái thứ mày phải uống thuốc phải chữa trị kể cả vấn đề tiền nong nữa tiền lương hưu của anh ấy thì mình cũng không biết bao nhiêu nhưng mà cứ cậu khi ca cái cóp đến tháng 3 lại bắt đầu là ới là bình ơi việt ơi tao muốn đi sang bên bên đấy để đi tìm mình chưa thấy bao giờ anh ấy muốn dừng lại cả War is the most terrible thing on earth because it only causes casualties for both sides. But deep inside, it leaves scars on the body and the mind of the veterans. Vietnam has lost so many brilliant young men and women in the American war for the national independence and freedom. For those on the other side of the battlefield, they also suffered huge losses in lives and the aftermaths of the war remain lingering on. Brian, I believe those that directly engage with the war understand it best. So could you tell us how the war made you, your families and your riflemen suffer? Going into a restaurant cafe, I would always have to sit in a position where I could see the door. I had to know where I could escape from. It's called heightened vigilance. Anger is another major problem with post-traumatic stress. And it can be from the slightest of disagreement or something, something that irritates. Do you know how many Australian veterans suffer PTSD just like you? I don't know the numbers. Has it as a good guesstimate, 80%. Nearly everyone that I served with, all the, the, the personnel who would normally be up the front doing the fighting, most have post-traumatic stress to some degree. Mm -hmm. Others worse than that. So do you say that you are now still living with PTSD? Yes. How are you dealing with it? It's something I just have to live with. Uh, um, I've been on medication for 20 years, right this very moment, with the assistance of my psychiatrist. I'm going off the medication because we both believe that the medication wasn't really doing any good because I'd become immune to it. Um, but I feel great. Um, there has been one or two occasions over the last few weeks where my anger has risen. Um, and I found it very, very difficult to bring it under control. It's not easy just to turn around and walk away because I've been taught to fight and not flight. What is your biggest desire now? To live a happy life for as long as possible. Um, control these outbursts of anger because I don't like it. I don't like getting angry and whatever. Another aspect was the, the dealing with crowds. I felt threatened going into a major shopping centre with so many people around. I'd have to leave because I felt threatened. I'd be watching thinking that maybe 
somebody was going to attack me or inflict something on me. It's more than 40 years since the war ended, but its brutality and devastation will stay in the mind of veterans like Brian Cleaver, perhaps to their last breath. At the age of 68, the returns to Vietnam to search for the burial site of the 42 Vietnamese martyrs have helped him partly gain peace of mind, or as said by Brian himself, heal the wounds of war in his soul. Let's wish him succeed so that he can end the journey that he has pursued for 14 years now. Once it happens, his lifetime desire will be fulfilled. Brian, thank you very much for being here with us today and sharing your touching story with our show. Thank you for inviting me on the show. I hope that the Vietnamese people have learned something about the aspects, the long-lasting aspects of war long after war has finished. War is a filthy, dirty game, no matter what war. And I hope that our viewers will hear your message and understand your story and, and your message. Thank you for allowing me to speak my life. And that's it for this edition of Talk Vietnam. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time. War is one of the most horrible experiences any man or woman could have in their life. Those who survive and go home, the wounds that they carry for the rest of their lives, they are passed on to their children, their children's children. We are now into the third generation of post-traumatic stress of Agent Orange. It's terrible. You know, the collateral damage is more damaging than the war itself. Chiến tranh là cái gì đó tồi tệ nhất, biết bao nhiêu tổn thất về nhân mạng, về tài sản mà không có gì bù đắp được. Đấy, ví dụ như cái trường hợp tiền bộ này đây, 48 năm trôi qua rồi, 42 người nằm đó, thân nhân cha mẹ họ hàng người ta mong đợi mà mình không mang về được. The war is finished. And now when I meet Vietnamese veterans, it is like meeting a brother. It's a very strange feeling that you really feel in your heart. You can look in their eyes and you can see that they also have that same feeling of recognition that yes, we were enemies now. We are friends.